Hello, everybody. You're very welcome to uh, this webinar, which is hosted by FEMS Research in collaboration with the East Lipid Conference. My name is John Morrissey. I'm uh, editor in chief of FEMS East Research, and I'm co chairing this session today uh, along with uh, Edward uh, Krakowin and uh, Verena Sievers from Chalmers University. So, I, just before we, we get going on the webinar itself, I thought I'd just say a couple of words about uh, FEMS and FEMS East Research before you I, I add, sorry, before I hand you over to my co chair. So, so I expect uh, most people here, but maybe not all, are familiar with FEMS. It's a Federation of European Microbiology Societies. And you can see it's a network of over 30,000 uh, microbiologists um, right across all disciplines of microbiology. And a big part of what FEMS does is it connects microbiologists through organizing conferences, sponsoring conferences, sponsoring conference prizes, and publishing journals. And uh, here's a list of seven journals that FEMS publishes um, right across the spectrum. They, you know, we like to encourage people to publish in these journals, their society journals, and that means that any income that's generated from these journals goes back to the community. Uh, so, so we think that's, that's a, a, a worthy um, cause to be supporting with your publications. As I mentioned, I'm Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Use Research, um, and we, we publish Sorry, I thought I had another slide in there. So, so we publish articles right, right across the spectrum of yeast physiology and genetics, covering um, fundamental biology and applied biology, co covering uh, pathogens, saccharomyces, non-pathogens. Um, so so any, any uh, papers that advance the knowledge of yeast physiology and genetics and application you are eligible to be considered by FEMS UC Search. We also publish uh, various uh, thematic issues and special editions. Um, and I just wanted to mention this one that I think you will have seen in any case with your registration. We've just published a virtual special issue where we pulled together um, a collection of papers on both fundamental and applied aspects of yeast lipid research uh, that, that were published uh, in FEMS over the last you know, 12 to 18 months. And this is really just, um, I mean, partly because these are interesting papers, but also hopefully to give uh, attendees here who are all, of course, specialists in uh, yeast uh, lipid biology, uh, an idea of the types of papers th that, that we can publish. And hopefully some of you here will consider FEMS EC search uh, for, for your own papers. So I will, uh, I will stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to hand over to now, one of my two chairs, uh, Dr. Edward uh, Kukoven uh, from Chalmers University in, in Gothenburg, um, who, who's also one of the co-chairs of the Yeast Lipid Conference uh, that you will all be familiar with. And Edward is, uh, is going to take over now. All right. Uh, thank you, John, for the... Uh, Welcome to this uh, to this um, webinar. So I will say a few words about the Yeast Lipid Conference, and this is uh, a conference series that has been going on since 1995 already, and it's been happening the last um, since 2001. It's been happening every two years, and the last time was then actually in 2019 in Ljubljana, Slovenia, and this is uh, a conference series where the topic is basically any aspect of yeast or fungal lipids. And this can be metabolism of phospholipids in sterols, uh, protein membrane interactions, yeasts as a platform for lipid production, uh, yeast as a model organism for human uh, pathogenesis related to lipids, or, well, any other aspects related uh, to this. And uh, we particularly want to encourage young scientists like PhD students and postdocs uh, to present their research uh, during these conferences. Uh, so last time it was the 14th Yeast Lipid Conference, uh, and in 2021 we were planning to organize the 15th Yeast Lipid Conference, uh, but you can imagine that this was not happening uh, this year. We decided to delay it one year, and it will actually take place in 2022, the 1st to the 3rd of June. 
it will happen at Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. And here we will have uh, three sessions, one related to phospholipids, sterols, and metabolism, uh, protein membrane interactions, and interorganelle membrane contract sites, and yeast as a platform for lipid production. So just a few words about Gothenburg. It's the second largest city in Sweden, and it's located on the west coast, as you can see here, has about 600,000 inhabitants. And actually, uh, this year, it's existing 400 years uh, since its foundation. Just a few pictures of, of beautiful Gothenburg, um, which is so located on the coast, and it has canals that were built by the, by the Dutch many years ago. So you see a lot of water in the city. Um, we also have a theme park. It is located in the city center. Uh, and there's a lot of nice Swedish and particularly West Coast uh, delicacies to be to be had. We have an exciting list of speakers for this conference that have already all confirmed um, their participation. And we have received funding from uh, from FEMS actually to also provide travel grants for early career scientists. So. I very much want to invite you to, if you are excited after uh, today's webinar, to also join us in Gothenburg in 2022 uh, for the in-person uh, Yeast Lipid Conference. Uh, and here's a link to our website, and also you can sign up to the mailing list uh, to make sure that you uh, stay up to date. But of course, so we delayed the conference by one year, but we did not want to completely have no yeast lipids in people's lives uh, in 2021. So we decided to team up with, uh, with FEMS for a, uh, for a webinar that's happening today. And for this, we have uh, four speakers divided into sessions. The first session is more about fundamental yeast lipids, and the second session is more about uh, uh, yeast as uh, for production uh, of lipids. So. I guess we can just get started with the with the first session, and there I can say that um, we advertise that the first speaker of today would be Professor Maya Schuldinger from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, uh, with a talk titled "The Regulatory Mechanisms Underpinning Direct Mitochondrial Nucleus Contacts in the Yeast Cell." But unfortunately, Maya Schuldinger had to, uh, at last minute, excuse herself from presenting her work uh, because of personal reasons. But we actually will hear from a talented postdoc from her lab, Dr. Michael Eisenberg, uh, who is the first author of the work that uh, Professor Schuldinger was also planning to focus on. So I think we have a, a very high quality replacement uh, for her instead. Uh, and I would say without further ado, I hand over to uh, Dr. Eisenberg and uh, looking forward to hear your talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay, cool. So, uh, first, thank you very much. And yeah, I'm not uh, Maya, I'm uh, Michal Eisenberg Bold. Uh, I'm uh, doing a postdoc uh, in our lab. And uh, first, Maya sends our apologies for not being able to join us today. Um, and I hope I will be able to step into her shoes. And I want to thank the organizers for giving me oops, the opportunity. Wait, sorry. Oops, sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share with you my science today. So, um, I'm trying to move the slides ahead. Um, hmm. Okay, so this is my son, Lavi, and he turned three uh, the other day. And I decided that this is a good time to start teaching him some cell biology. So I downloaded um, these coloring pages for him. Um, for some, okay, so I downloaded these coloring pages for him. Um, but I was quite surprised to see that they don't really accurately represent the cell. 
because in these coloring pages, it looks like each organelle does its own thing and that organelles work in isolation. But today we know that this is completely not the case. So we know that organelles can't function alone as isolated environments and they need to work together in cooperation in order to have a functioning cell unit. Therefore, organelles must communicate between them. Now, one way of communication between organelles is through membrane contact sites. So these are areas of close proximity between the two organelles, allowing transfer of lipids, ions, and other molecules between them. And don't think that these are areas where the organelles are randomly bumping into each other, because in these contacts, the organelles are actively tethered together by tethering machineries. So in recent years, it became clear that these contact sites are fundamental for cellular health and for maintaining cellular homeostasis. So it wasn't a surprise to find that they played key roles in many different diseases, and this list is only for mitochondrial contact sites, and the full list is even longer. So in our lab, we're interested in understanding contact sites biology. And as it became clear that many different organelles can form these contacts, uh, many new questions emerged, such as what are all the contact sites in the cell? And also which proteins can act as tethers and regulators in these contact sites and carry different functions in the contact? So since contact sites are evolutionary conserved and they can be found basically in every cell type, uh, we are studying them in the East, uh, the model organism, the Baker's East Saccharomyces cerevisia. And first, uh, as I mentioned, we wanted to understand what are all the contact sites of the cell. We wanted to have this comprehensive map of all the different contacts. But the problem is that contact sites are quite small, so only 10 to 100 nanometers are separating the two organelles. So they're below the, fraction, the diffraction limit of fluorescence microscopy. And they're also quite rare to find, so it's hard to discover them um, by electron microscopy. So to overcome this, uh, Nadav Shai, a former PhD student from the lab, uh, together with Renat Zaltskva, who is a research associate in the lab, they developed an approach that allowed them to visualize contact sites in an unbiased manner without any prior knowledge on them. And they use a split fluorescent approach to visualize these proximities between the organelles. So the idea is quite simple. Um, we take a fluorescent protein, in this case, it's a venous protein, and we split it to two halves. We tag organelle one when, with one part of the venous, the VN, and we tag organelle two with the second part of the venous, the VC. And you can imagine that these VN and VC are coating the entire organelle. Now, only in areas of close proximity between the two membranes, as is happening in the contact, the full venous protein would form and we will get the fluorescent signal. So that is a way to mark specifically these proximities between the organelles. And we call the E strain that has both the VC and the VN in it, the reporter strain, for its ability to report on the contact site. And this is how it looks. So we have here our cell and we have the green dots here that are marking um, the contact sites. They're marking where the contact sites are found. Now, amazingly, when Nadav used these pairwise combinations of reporter, he was able to see that basically every two organelles have a contact site between them. So here we have VN and we have different organelles of the cell here and we have the VC with different organelles here. And you see the cells and the, the green uh, fluorescent signal marks the different contacts. So you can see that basically every two organelles in the cell can form these contact sites. And this was later also shown in yeast and in the mammalian cells. Okay, so now we know that basically every two organelles can form these contacts, but we wanted to understand what are the proteins that can act as tethers and regulators and carry out the specific functions of the contact. So this is a work that uh, is done by Inesh Castro. She's a postdoc in the lab. And the idea, uh, again, is quite simple. We have our yeast uh, strain that had the reporter. So we have the reporter marking the contact. And we can take another yeast strain that has a cherry tag protein. And then we can look for co-localization between the cherry tag protein and our reporters. 
And if we see that this protein is co-localizing with a reporter, we can say that it is a contact site resident and it is found in the contact site. So this is basically the approach that we uh, decided to use. But the thing is that, as you can imagine, East have about 6,000 genes. And tagging every one of them with a cherry tag one by one uh, can be a very uh, time-consuming uh, mission. But uh, luckily for Ineshi, she could use a library that was recently uh, developed in the lab by uh, Ido and Uri, two former PhD students. And they created an East library where every single East protein is tagged at its end terminus. So here we have, for example, the gene. Um, you have a, a GFP tag for this gene and a constitutive promoter. And this was done for every one of the single genes in the yeast genome. The cool thing about this library is that it is made with a technology that is called swap and tag, or SWAT. And this was done in collaboration with Michael Knopf. And this strategy allows us to make basically every library that we want in a rapid, efficient, and easy way. Um, so here, for example, we can create a library where we have every single protein tagged with cherry, and it is expressed under the TEP promoter. So this is a constitutive strong promoter. And um, basically, now we have this collection of yeast where every single gene is both tagged with cherry and overexpressed. So now what Ineshi could do is she can take this reporter strain that I mentioned that marks the different contact sites in green, and she can integrate it into the library where every single colony marks one gene that is both overexpressed and tagged with cherry. And then using our uh, automated microscopy system, she can look for these cases where she sees co-localization between the cherry protein and the reporter, as I mentioned earlier. Now, as you can imagine, she has to visualize thousands of different uh, strains. Uh, but in our lab, uh, doing a high content screens is actually a child's play. And I'll show you now how uh, uh, Rotem, Nomi, and Matan are doing a screen in our lab. You have the banners explaining a bit uh, what they're doing. Okay, so um, using this automated uh, microscopy system, uh, we were able to uncover hundreds of new contact site resident proteins and regulators. And we have this list of hundreds of proteins, but um, I think going over the list one by one might be a bit boring. So I decided that in the rest of the time that I have, I would focus on one specific contact site that is uh, my personal favorite contact site, and that is a project that um, I did together with uh, uh, Nama Tsung, who is a PhD student in the lab. And Nama and I um, are interested in the contact site between the mitochondrion and the nuclear ER, or mitochondrion nucleus contact sites. And for many years, um, people treated these contacts as a type of mitochondria ER contact sites. So it seems like sometimes mitochondria can form contacts with tubular ER. So here we have the mitochondrion and the tubular uh, ER in 
this is the contact with the tubular ER. And also sometimes they form contacts with the nuclear ER, but they're all practically the same. But um, in recent years, it became clear that these mitochondria nucleus contacts actually have special roles and special tethering machineries. For example, a role for the transfer of cholesterol was suggested uh, in mammalian cells, and also a role for the transfer of heme was suggested for yeast. So Naama and I decided that we want to find what is the tethering machinery for these mitochondria nucleus contact sites in our model organism, in yeast. And we also wanted to understand what is the function for these contacts. So to do this, um, we decided to use the same approach that I already mentioned. We have here our E strain that expresses the mitonucleus reporter, and we integrate it into the library where every gene is both overexpressed and tagged with cherry. And then we image these strains in the same way that I, I just showed you in the movie. And following this screen, we have our list of hits, in this case, 55 hits. Um, but we decided to focus on our favorite protein, which was a protein that was never studied before. It didn't even have a name. So uh, we decided that we are calling it CNM1. And the name stands for Contact Nucleus Mitochondria 1. And I hope that by the end of the talk, I would convince you that this name is appropriate for this protein. So um, this is our mitonucleus reporter. This is how it looks. We have our cells and we have the fluorescent signal. And um, we have your cherry tagged CNM1. And I hope you can appreciate that it is nicely co-localizing with the uh, signal of the reporter. So showing that it is a resident of the contact. But the cool thing was that when we overexpress CNM1, so this is overexpressed CNM1 and we compare it to the control, we see that the reporter signal is much stronger and elongated. And the reason for that became clear when we just tagged our nuclear ER in, with green and we have a mitochondrial marker in red, and these are the control cells. But when we overexpress CNM1, now we see that mitochondria are clustering around the nucleus, forming these very um, in large proximities and this is just by overexpressing CNM1 so we don't have the reporter here we have nothing we just overexpress CNM1 and we see that mitochondria are clustering around the nucleus. So then we decided to go for uh, to do some electron microscopy because electron microscopy is basically the gold standard in uh, studying contact sites. So here we have electron micrographs and this is the control uh, strain we see the nucleus and we see a mitochondrion here, and we have a quite distinct contact site, but honestly, they were quite rare to find. But when we overexpress CNM1, now we see that the mitochondria are forming these huge contacts with the nucleus. They are surrounding the nucleus, forming these very elongated contact sites. Again, only by overexpressing CNM1. And this the the amazing thing is that this happened in every single micrograph that we checked so we checked tens of different cells all of them showed these elongated contact sites that were very um, abundant in these cells okay so due to the lack of time i won't go through everything that we did but we next wanted to check if cnm1 can act as a bona fide tether for the mitochondria nucleus contact sites and a few years ago we published the, what we think are the standards for a protein to be called the tether and we wanted to see if cnm1 can fulfill these uh, requirements so first we found that it is a nuclear membrane protein and this was done by lila from the lab of uh, doron rapaport uh, we next saw that it is specifically located at the areas of contact between the nucleus and mitochondria. And finally, as I showed you, it can exert a tethering force, so it has the, the ability to cluster mitochondria around the nucleus. Okay, but how does it function? How is it doing what it is doing? So to answer this question, um, we decided to do an, another screen. In this case, we have our strain that overexpresses CNM1, and we have our nuclear marker in green and a mitochondrial marker in red. And because we are overexpressing CNM1, we see that mitochondria are clustered around the nucleus. Now we're integrating it into our deletion library. So this is a collection of yeast colonies wherein every single colony has one deletion of a gene or a mutation. So this is basically covering the entire yeast genome. And then we image them using the same approach that I showed you. 
And now we're looking for cases where we no longer see this clustering around the, mito around the nucleus anymore. So we see that mitochondria are not clustered anymore. And we can assume that if this is a result of a deletion of a gene, um, that we deleted the gene and we no longer see this clustering, we can assume that this gene is somehow involved in the contact sites formation um, by CNM1. So um, one of the hits that we got, a very interesting hit, is a protein called TOM70. And here we have the control cells and we see mitochondria surrounding the nucleus. And when we delete TOM70, we see that we no longer see this clustering of mitochondria around the nucleus. And uh, TOM70 is actually part of the translocase of the outer membrane, so part of the TOM complex. And this is a complex that is responsible for import of proteins uh, into the outer mitochondrial membrane. So you can ask, okay, this can be either a direct effect that TOM70 can bind CNM1 and they form the contacts together, but this can also be due to an indirect effect because it might be that TOM70 is responsible for importing a different protein into mitochondria and that is why we got it as a hit. So as you can see here, TOM70 has a transmembrane domain and we did several experiments to check if this is a direct or an indirect effect and to make a long story short, we found that it is a direct effect and we think that TOM70 can directly bind CNM1. So one example for such an experiment that we did, uh, we deleted the transmembrane domain of TOM70 and we tagged it with GFP. So now we see that it became cytosolic. And we also see again that mitochondria are not clustered around the nucleus anymore. And when we overexpress CNM1, we now see that TOM70 is basically dragged to the nuclear ER. So we see the, the fluorescent green signal uh, around the nucleus. Basically, it is CNM1 dragging TOM70 to its localization around the nucleus. And uh, we did additional experiments. We did also some co-IP uh, to confirm that indeed we have an, a direct interaction between TOM70 and CNM1. But um, because this is a lipid uh, seminar, um, I want to end my talk with uh, three hits that we got that are actually uh, related to uh, lipid biosynthesis. And in this case, we're talking about the uh, phosphatidylcholine PC biosynthesis pathway, uh, ENO2, CHO2, and OP3. So you can see that in these deletions, although we still overexpress CNM1, we don't see the same clustering of mitochondria around the nucleus as we see in the control cell. So uh, uh, these uh, proteins are actually, as I mentioned, involved in the biosynthetic pathway of PC. So we have here uh, uh, PS forming PE and then PC. And ENO2 is a transcriptional activator for OP3 and CHOT2. And one thing that was really interesting about these hits is that it was already known that the PC biosynthetic pathway uh, relies ex uh, extensively on ER mitochondria contact sites. And it was shown that the Hermes complex, which is a known mediator for contacts between the ER and mitochondria, has a role in the transfer of PS and PE between the ER and mitochondria. So uh, next, when we have PC forming in the ER, it is clear that it has to go back to mitochondria somehow because mitochondrial membranes have about 44% of PC. So we hypothesize that maybe CNM1 has a role in these contacts to transfer back PC from the ER to uh, mitochondria. Okay, so we know that uh, deletion of ENO2, CHO2, and OP3 result in less of these contacts, and we wanted to understand why. Why do we see um, less of them? And uh, the reason for that is that when we abolish CHO2, OP3, and ENO2, we see reduced levels of CNM1. So here we have CNM1 tagged with GFP in the control. And when we delete CHO2, OP3, or ENO2, we see that we have less um, CNM1. And um, the cool thing about um, PEAST is that we can bypass this uh, pathway so we can add external choline to the media. And then the yeast would utilize it uh, through the Kennedy pathway to form the novo PC. And indeed, here shown in this Western blot, we can see that when we delete CHO2, OP3, and ENO2, we have less uh, CNM1. But when we add external choline to the media, we can restore the levels of CNM1. They, can, they, are, becoming, uh, um, they are becoming more abundant in the same, uh, like in the control. 
Okay, so now that we uh, have uh, Delta CHO2 and Delta OP3 overexpressing CNM1, we see less of the contacts. And when we add choline to the media, we now also see that we get the contacts that are restored. Uh, we get uh, back the contacts, mitochondria clustering around the nucleus um, again. So restoring PC levels um, enables uh, CNM1-mediated contact sites to form again. And this also suggests that it is the PC itself and not the proteins. It's not CHO2 or OP3, the proteins, it's the PC levels that are regulating uh, the abundance of CNM1 and the contact. So uh, to summarize what I showed you today, um, I hope I convinced you that CNM1 is a novel uh, tethering machinery for uh, the mitochondria nucleus contact sites, and it works together with TOM70 to form these contacts, and that CNM1 levels are regulated by uh, PC, um, by uh, uh, PC, and I can just say that this is, uh, we know that this is happening post-translationally. Okay, and uh, with that, I would like to uh, end. I would like to uh, thank Maya, uh, the most amazing mentor. All of the people here uh, involved are people that the work was mentioned. And I want to uh, thank you, uh, especially for the amazing drawings. And thank you very much for your attention. And I would love to get your questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Michel, for a very exciting, uh, exciting talk. Uh, I forgot to mention to everybody listening in that you're, of course, welcome to post any questions that you have for uh, the speakers. Uh, but I see that we already got a question in, so I'll just get started with that one from uh, Varinia Lopez Ramirez. She's asking, in what development stages do the contacts between organelles, do you have the contacts between organelles? Are they uh, more frequent or are they, are they random at certain stages? So if I understood correctly the question, um, we see them basically all the time. Most of our work we're doing in yeast that are grown in the logarithmic phase. So basically they're always um, dividing. So we see them, but also in stationary phase and when basically you see less of the division of the cell, this we still see contacts. And actually we have several contacts that are uh, more abundant in logarithmic phase and more some of them are more abundant in stationary phase and you have different contacts forming according to um, the metabolic state of the cell. But they're basically always there. So you can find them all the time. So are these then also very, in a way, rigid uh, contact sites uh, or is it more uh, even though you see them throughout the whole um, cell cell cycle, is it that contact sites come and go all the time? Um, I'm not sure I got it, but basically we see them all the time. I mean, these mitochondria nucleus contacts, we see them more in logarithmic phase, and then when cells enter into stationary phase, we see that actually we have less contacts. Um, so I, I'm not sure I, I answered the question, but, um, but but we do see them all the time, just sometimes more abundant and sometimes less. Um, as a question here, uh, that in the screen there were 55 hits, uh, and are the others, and not just uh, CNM1, are they also involved in this uh, in this context size? So yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, actually, we had uh, we narrowed down the list to seven proteins uh, that are that might have roles in these contacts, and some of them we're still working on to find out more about them. Um, I can just say that some of them seem to regulate the contacts extent, but we were focusing more on tethers, so we wanted to find the actual tethering machinery for this contact. So that is why we focused on CNM1. And another thing that we uh, noticed is that. Um, uh, some of these hits actually affected also mitochondria ER contact. So, for example, if we got a hit, we checked how is it affecting the Hermes complex, which is a known mediator for the ER mitochondria contact. And if we found that these hits are affecting the Hermes complex, we decided not to focus on them because we wanted to find something that is separated for, from the known tethering machineries, and we wanted to find uh, new tethering machineries for these nuclear ER or nucleus contact sites. Clear. Um, I have another question from Christian Ungerman. Uh, is CNM1 in contact with the lipid synthesis machinery at the ER? And does this then mean that CNM1 
one is a PC transfer protein? Um, so that is something that I would love to to answer, but uh, sadly uh, we still don't know. Um, we haven't done any in vitro experiments, or really, uh, um, we we haven't done that yet. I mean, we're now still uh, testing um, the idea that that can directly bind maybe PC or affect the levels of PC in the different organelles. Uh, but uh, this is something that we're still testing, so I can't say if that is for sure. We know for sure that PC levels are affecting CNM1, and by that it is affecting the contact, but we don't know yet to say for sure that this contact is responsible for the transfer of PC directly, and um, this is still a, an, an hypo hypothesis that we have, so we still haven't tested it yet to say. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Sando Yuk. And um, the question here is, would like to ask about the meaning of the contact between the mitochondria and the nucleus. Do they exchange something through the contact or what do they exactly do? So our hypothesis for now is that they, they might exchange PC, so phosphatidylcholine between them. So once PC is formed in the ER, it has to go back to mitochondria somehow. So we think that this might be a way to, to transfer um, th this phospholipid. And we know that transfer of phospholipids occurs in, in other contact sites in the mitochondria ER contact, for example. Um, and we also found, interestingly, that some of the enzymes that are responsible for uh, PC biosynthesis, both through the regular pathway and the Kennedy pathway, are actually enriched in the nuclear ER. So that is also something that we find that is interesting, that it might be that PC from the nuclear ER specifically can move to mitochondria through the contacts. Um, but I also can mention that um, these contacts um, were studied uh, also in other contexts. Uh, we have uh, we know that in mammalian cells they can be used for transfer of cholesterol and they have a role in the retrograde response that communicates uh, mitochondrial stress to the nucleus. We also know that um, uh, it was suggested to have a role in, uh, in cellular inheritance in um, different um, organisms. So they were kind of suggested to have different roles throughout the years in, in, in inheritance, in retrograde, in uh, heme transfer also I mentioned. Uh, but for this specific machinery that we found for the CNM1, because we see that it is uh, regulated by PC levels, we think that it might have a role in the transfer of PC between the organelles. Right. These are more questions coming in, and it's all sort of related to whether there's transfer or binding uh, with PC. So it seems that this is very much on people's uh, people's <laughs> thoughts. Uh, but you're saying that you are. You don't have any proof for this now, but you're looking into it. So yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, sadly, I can't, I can't give you this proof. Uh, I would love to give it to you, but uh, sadly, for now, we we still didn't see it. Um, um, then uh, it. I want to finish off with uh, with one other question: Is what if you knock out CNM one? What is the phenotype of that? So. Um, we were able to show that um, when you just add choline to yeast cells, um, they form more of these contacts between the mitochondria and the nucleus uh, without even overexpressing CNM1. I mean, I believe that they upregulate CNM1 and they form these contacts. And then when we delete CNM1, we don't see this upregulation of contact um, uh, between mitochondria and the nucleus. Uh, but other than that, if you're asking about um, growth, um, let's say uh, um, growth curves and, and, and growth on plates, we don't see any uh, specific um, phenotype. And I also should say that, I mean, as I mentioned, um, these mitochondria nucleus contacts, we think that they're not they're not very abundant. Um, I mean, they can be found, I guess, in every cell, but they're, it's not like they are super abundant. So it might be that when we delete CNM1, um, this can be, for example, maybe rescued by other contacts. Maybe the mitochondria ER contacts can rescue for that. And as we know already that different contact sites can sometimes do um, uh, compensations. Loss of one contact can be compensated by another contact. So this uh, might be also the reason why we don't see any specific phenotype for the loss of CNM1. All right. Thank you very much for, uh, for your presentation today and the exciting discussion afterwards. Uh, there are more questions, but unfortunately, in the interest of time, we're going to have to move on to the, the next speaker. So I just want to thank you again, Michelle, for presenting today. Thank you very much.
So then I would like to say that, as I said before, at the Yeast Lipid Conference, we very much want to encourage young researchers to also present their research. So that's why we've also invited uh, Paulina Kanovicova from the Comenius University in Bratislava, Slovakia, where she's a PhD student, uh, to present her work as well. And the title of her talk is The Role of Phosphatidylglycerol in the Manifestation of Bars Syndrome. Uh, so with that, I just want to hand over to Paulina. And again, if you have any questions, uh, just during the presentation, pop them already in the chat, and then uh, All right. Uh, can you see my slides? I hope so. <laughs> okay. So. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, mitochondrial phospholipids uh, have been the object of interest for uh, many scientists uh, because of their medical significance. And uh, the best characterized is uh, cardiolipin, since its impaired uh, metabolism has been associated with aging and diseases such as cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, and also type 2 diabetes and the best uh, example of cardiolipin importance is uh, a life-threatening disease called Bart syndrome which is directly caused by cardiolipin deficiency but what about other mitochondrial phospholipids do they also play roles in uh, disease manifestation uh, we focus on uh, phosphatidylglycerol, it's an anionic phospholipid, uh, and it's uh, well known as a cardiolipin precursor. However, in uh, various organisms, it also performs uh, functions outside of mitochondria. It's one of the major uh, bacterial membrane phospholipids, it's the only phospholipid in tiloquid membrane, and it is also crucial anti-inflammatory component of lung surfactant. In the yeast, uh, especially Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, its uh, levels are, are tightly regulated and kept very low. And even at uh, this uh, low, uh, even at this uh, low uh, level, it uh, is still important for function of some mitochondrial proteins, uh, such as uh, cytochrome C oxidase, or for activation of inositol uh, sphingolipid phospholipase IC1. Uh, regulation of phosphatidylglycerol metabolism in yeast has been studied uh, in our laboratory for uh, several years now, and this study started by uh, discovery of uh, phosphatidylglycerol specific phospholipase C called PGC1. PGC1 is an interesting protein that hydrolyzes PG to a glycerol free phosphate and diacylglycerol. And in case of its absence, um, PG is accumulated and spreads out of mitochondria evenly to uh, other um, membranes. Um, based on our results, we also proposed uh, model of um, regulation of activation of PGC1. Uh, it's been previously localized to lipid droplets, however, it's not active there. Uh, it's only stored there and protected for, from degradation, and activation of PGC1 and uh, degradation of uh, uh, PG were only observed in mitochondria and uh, or ER, which are uh, phospholipid uh, bilayers. But what is the reason for this regulation? Um, we know that both lack and uh, excess of uh, phosphatidylglycerol are harmful for cells. Uh, in case of, of uh, PG abundance in PGC1 mutant, we observed uh, fragmented mitochondria and impaired oxidative phosphorylation. And uh, these results suggest that uh, phosphatidylglycerol levels um, may be also important for, for proper, proper uh, mitochondrial morphology and function, similarly to cardiolipin. Cardiolipin is also an anionic phospholipid, but it has two negative charges, four fatty acyl chains, and um, it is conical shape. And uh, due to this, um, uh, due to this uh, specific um, 
properties, it uh, is involved in most mitochondrial uh, processes. Uh, the uh, major cardiolipin is, uh, uh, its, it's fatty acid uh, composition is uh, tissue specific, uh, but it um, contains uh, mainly unsaturated fatty acids. And double bonds in unsaturated fatty acids are very prone to oxidation, and therefore cardiolipin undergoes process of remodeling, in which uh, saturated fatty acids are cleaved, uh, monoisocardiolipin is formed, and then protein tafazine um, adds unsaturated fatty acid. Uh, in case of Bart syndrome, mutation because of mutation in gene TAS, uh, tafazine is not functional and uh, therefore monolyzed or cardiolipin is accumulated uh, and the total uh, amount of cardiolipin is decreased and this leads to symptoms of Bart syndrome which are cardiomyopathy, skeletal myopathy, neutropenia, growth delay and so on. Yes, the Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae has uh, served as a powerful tool of to study cardiolipin uh, via synthetic pathway, uh, mainly uh, due to the existence of viable mutants. And yes, uh, this mutant has been used in several studies that significantly contributed to our knowledge of Bart syndrome. However, uh, often in a uh, uh, often uh, yeast uh, Tesla model. Um, showed only mild defects uh, that were observed uh, due to test mutation in other organisms. And what are the differences between a uh, yeast uh, TAS mutant and uh, some mammalian uh, Bart syndrome cell culture models is that uh, these mammalian cells accumulate not only monolyzer cardiolipin, but also phosphatidylglycerol, which is kept low in the yeast TAS mutant. And therefore, we decided to look at uh, what is the effect of facetal glycerol accumulation in yeast Bart syndrome model, and we prepared double mutant uh, PGC1 TAS1. In these pictures, you can see comparison between uh, human cell line uh, double mutant. Uh, sorry, human cell line uh, uh, TAS mutant, and um, uh, double mutant. Sorry, and uh, double mutant uh, PGC1 TAS1 preparing yeast, and uh, the mitochondrial uh, phospholipid profile in a, I don't know if you can see this uh, in a yeast double mutant is much more similar to uh, uh, TAS uh, mammalian cell model uh, than is uh, TAS1, and. Uh, Subsequently, uh, we looked at how uh, increased uh, PG levels affect uh, some mitochondrial functions in TAS1. Uh, mitochondrial morphology often reflects um, their function. And previously, abnormal mitochondrial ultrastructure was observed in a, a fibroblast from Bart uh, syndrome patients. And they observed these um, abnormal circular arrays. The, these are Christie, and we saw uh, similar onion like structures in our yeast uh, model of uh, Bart syndrome. And using fluorescent confocal microscopy in here, we also observed this uh, circular shaped mitochondria, and importantly, their frequency was uh, doubled in a, a double uh, mutant accumulating uh, PGC1. Well, then we looked at what other uh, mitochondrial functions are worsened or affected in a double mutant compared to TAS1 strain, and we observed a decreased oxidative phosphorylation of a double mutant compared to TAS1 or wild type, and this um, drop in oxygen consumption might be caused by uh, decreased uh, activity, um, ox cytochrome C oxidase activity of complex 4, and uh, this change in activity was not um, caused by a change in protein level. Mm. And next, we figured out uh, why yeast TAS, uh, TAS model of Bart syndrome uh, does not accumulate uh, PG as was observed in some mammalian models. Uh, we measured decreased, in TAS1, we measured decreased um, 
mitochondrial activity of PGC1, which is enzyme uh, necessary for synthesis of PG. And we also measured the uh, increased, uh, increased um, degradation uh, of PG in this strain. And uh, these results uh, indicate the tendency of uh, PAS1 to keep low PG levels and to avoid uh, dam damaging effects of um, PG. So, uh, phosphatidylglycerol glycerol accumulation caused a further deterioration of mitochondrial functions that we tested. And we think that this could be explained by different shape of uh, phosphatidyl uh, glycerol because it is the lack of conically shaped uh, cardiolipin, uh, remodeled cardiolipin, that plays an important role uh, in the onset of uh, BART syndrome. And the accumulation of cylindrically shaped uh, PG could uh, further impair um, thermodynamic stability of um, damaged membrane. And the other explanation may be connected to uh, importance of uh, PG uh, in function of some mitochondrial protein, which one of, and we know uh, it could be the cytochrome C oxidase. So we hypothesize that uh, phosphatidylglycerol metabolism could be one of the physiological modifiers that affect the sever severity of uh, uh, symptoms uh, of uh, Bart syndrome patients, even with the same mutations. And next, we plan to study uh, regulation of um, phosphatidylglycerol metabolism in mammalian cells. And in the end, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to thank uh, to my co-workers and this work was supported by following grants. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, again, if you have any questions, leave them in the in the chat. Uh, then we have a discussion about that. So I'm very excited to hear or to see, yeah, to see your presents about how yeast can be used to study uh, human disease. Um, I'm just wondering, do you know whether so you showed this impaired oxfos uh, activity in yeast? How does that relate to the um, symptoms in bar, bar syndrome in humans? Do you know that? Well, uh, because uh, the, uh, in these cells uh, with uh, TAS uh, mutation, there is uh, not enough cardiolipin, uh, which is important for function of probably um, all proteins that are involved in OXFOS. Uh, even OXFOS in um, Bart syndrome patients is decreased. So this leads to um, formation of uh, not enough ATP, which is uh, responsible for um, symptoms that occur in Bar syndrome. I hope that okay. answers the question. Like the ATP, uh, uh, or this organization of ATP metabolism. Yes, yes. Then um, I have a question coming in here. Uh, that you showed an effect on complex four of oxidative phosphorylation. Is it very specific to this complex, or did you also look at other complexes, maybe complex three as well? Mm -hmm. We looked also at complex three, and we didn't observe any changes, but uh, we observed slight decrease in the activity of um, ATP uh, synthase uh, complex five. All right. Is there any other questions from the audience? All right. I think it was a very clear presentation. I think it's also again very exciting to see how I think a lot of us focus very much on just yeast on uh, maybe uh, yeah for production of of lipids or it's very nice to see that you use it to looking at uh, at human disease as well to see that it's more than just yeast what they are interested in mm. so i'd just like to thank you again for your presentation and uh exciting discussion afterwards so, thank you very much uh and then i will hand over to uh, my co-host, Verena, who will 
uh, lead the rest of this seminar. So I would like to welcome you to the uh, second part um, of this webinar, where we move into the more applied field. Um, and our first uh, speaker, our keynote speaker in the session is Rodrigo Ledesma. Um, he's a group leader at Imperial College in London, and he will talk about the sustainable production of lipids and lipid-derived molecules in Yarovia lipolytica. All right, thanks, Verena. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. And you can hear me? Great. Thank you. Can you see my course as well? Yes, we can also see the course. Okay. So thanks um, for the introduction, Verena. Thanks, uh, Ed, as well, for, and John, for the invitation to to talk here today and talk a little bit about this applied part of the webinar, where we're going to see in this particular about Jarovia Lipolitica, and I will introduce to Jarovia a little bit later, and we're going to see uh, how we can use this yeast to produce lipids. So first I would like to introduce to the group. So we are at Imperial College London uh, in, in this campus, South Kensington, which is central London really close to Hyde Park and all the museums, museums, so it's really nice around here, especially days like two days that are is sunny, which is quite unusual. Uh, we are part also of the Imperial College Center for Synthetic Biology, which is a multidisciplinary research environment with people from different departments, spanning from mathematics to uh, biology or bioengineering, such as my case. And uh, the research that we are doing is at the interface between synthetic biology and metabolic engineering. And uh, because the, the webinar is a bit broad and there might be people who are less familiar with these uh, terminologies, especially those coming from more, more fundamental or, or disease-related uh, lipid yeast research, I'm going to introduce you to these two concepts. Uh, synthetic biology is a discipline that is trying to, to bring engineering principles to biology and in particular principles coming from electrical engineering and mecha mechanical engineering which aims to, to to make biology more controllable predictable standardized and modular while metabolic engineering is the uh, tuning of metabolic fluxes in order to make a specific product uh, and it also brings in uh, engineering concept to biology but in, in this case uh, these concepts come from a different engineering field which is chemical engineering so in a chemical plant, you have different tank where different chemical reactions happen and in the end you make a product. In metabolism, this happens uh, very similarly, but instead of tank, we have reactions catalyzed by enzymes that change one metabolite into others, and in the end they make the product. So when I talked about this interface between these two uh, um, fields, in the biology and metabolic engineering, uh, I want to make an analogy to understand it better, which is what happened in our current production plants. And if you imagine any uh, chemical production plants for making I don't know, paper or materials, you have a ser series of uh, vessels where this reaction happens, but everything is controlled by different uh, tubes and valves, uh, and everything is integrated and, and regulated and making it reliable by electrical circuits that control the processes. So the idea is to try to, to make this in, in the cells as well, in cell factories, so we can use this fine tune and control from this uh, synthetic biology into the metabolic uh, fluxes to, to regulate them, to make the product of interest. So the aim, the aim of bringing these two fields together is to move to the bioeconomy, which basically try to replace, replace fossil fuel based chemistry to make uh, all the materials that we need, and like food, uh, yeah, materials uh, for construction, or uh, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and so on. So one way to, to get around fossil fuels is using lipids. So luckily lipids uh, can be converted into a variety of end products, like a pharmaceuticals, food, by plastic, by uh, chemicals, fuels. And this can be either biologically catalyzed or chemically catalyzed, starting from fatty acids. So where 
where we can find these fatty acids uh, is in, in vegetable oils, animal fats, but also in microbial oils. And this is what we are going to, to focus uh, today. So luckily, all these oils or, or lipids are, are more sustainable that, than fossil fuels. And that's why there's the interest in moving towards uh, lipids-based chemistry. And, and in particular, microbial oils, they have some advantages. Uh, so a microbial oil is basically an oil produced by a microbe by uh, fermenting a specific carbon source or substrate and making this oil. And this will happen uh, more efficiently in organisms called uh, oleogenous. And it can also happen by converting a cheap oil like waste cooking oil into a high value oil. The advantage of microbial oils is that, that they don't compete with food which is something that happens with animals and plants. They have shorter process cycles. They are independent of the season, climate, or geopolitics. Uh, they can be easily scal scaled up. They can use cheap uh, carbon sources. And we can do metabolic engineering, which means we can specifically make oils that, are, uh, that have a specific function or value. However, there are also some disadvantages uh, with microbial oils like they need aseptic condition, conditions. So these this micro, microbes are prone to contamination. Um, they require sometimes expensive substrates, normally sugars. Then they all need to be extracted from the cell, which can be an expensive process. And, and basically uh, it's, it's easy to produce oil, but it's not so, it's so, not so easy to produce high value oil. Luckily, uh, in the past couple of decades, we've been developing the field of synthetic biology that allow us to, to engineer uh, this organism to, to fight these disadvantages and, and make be more uh, feasible when we move them to industry. So the, the, um, something that is key is, uh, when we want to make microbial oils is select the right organism. So here I present a bunch of microorganisms that we, we work in, in our lab. And in particular, I want to draw the attention to, to the oleogenous uh, ones that are here, that mainly Jarobelli politica, Rhodosporian trungloides. These two organisms accumulate more than 20% of the cell dry weight as lipids. And, and in particular, we're going to talk today about Jarobelli politica. That is an organism that, as we will see, uh, has the capacity to produce lipids in high, high yields. So here I'm going to introduce you to this, this yeast. So it's, it's a yeast that is uh, kind of well studied nowadays, specifically in relation to lipid metabolism, uh, and specifically as well for the idea of bioproduction, we will see later. Uh, so the Arabia Lipolitica can produce uh, a, a, a decent amount of lipids uh, when it's grown in sugars, for example. And here you can see the lipids stain in green. So these are the lipid bodies stain with uh, body pie, body pie uh, that are mainly made by triacid glycerols. But Jarovia is also good at consuming lipids, and that's why it's called Lipolitica, and it's because it can degrade this lipid very efficiently. And here you can see an electric microscopy image where you see the, the yeast cell consuming these lipids that were present in the meat. So uh, more recently, Yarovia has been regarded a, a very, very good host for biotechnology and specifically for the production of these lipids that can be then converted as we, as we saw in fields or chemical. So a little bit of history of Yarovia. So it is, is, is known for, for many, many decades, but uh, its relationship with industry uh, start uh, in 1950s, when it's used to produce protein, single cell protein, as a source of protein for feeding. Even before that, uh, we have identified in, in cure meat and, and tissues. So it's, it has been helping us humans to make products since early, early times. In the 1970s, more application of this organism uh, were explored, especially the production of organic acid, citric acid, which is something else that Jarovia is naturally good at doing. It because it's able to degrade um, oils, it has been also proposed uh, for bioremediation, to remove oil spills, for example. And from the 2000s, uh, groups like uh, Claude Gallardin of German Nicot in France, they started to develop genetic engineering tools to modify this organism. And they grow and developed 
and there was a huge interest. You can see how the publications in in Nairobi started to, to rise around that time when there is an interest in making alternative to to petroleum for fossil fuels. And, and this, this goes up in 2017, more or less, when the price of the petroleum drops. And the scientific community tend to look at what other things we can do with Jarovia, and, and there's a shift towards high value limits. More recently, the past decade, there has been uh, many groups developing synthetic biology tools to more easily engineer this host. And we developed uh, things like Golden Gate uh, libraries, there has been groups developing efficient CRISPR tools to engineer metabolism uh, by knocking out genes, but also by expressing or repressing genes by CRISPR-A or CRISPR-I. Uh, and, and some groups that have been doing this, for example, Ian Wildon in the University of California, uh, Riverside. There are genome scale metabolic models of Jarovia, and Edward Kerkoven, one of the organizers here, developed a very, very comprehensive model for it. So we have a variety of tools and we know how met the living metabolism work, kind of. So we can use this to, to make products, to make units. And now I'm going to focus the rest of the talk in going through some examples of Yarovia to make units. So there has been a lot of uh, works and, and you can see here the numbers. This is uh, not completely up to date, but uh, there are around 200 uh, papers in Yarovia published yearly now, and this curve is growing exponentially. And, and there are also many companies working more and more with this organism. So, as you can imagine, there are a lot of works that have been uh, working in in this lipid metabolism and engineering it to, to make different products. So uh, there has been many works about trying to increase the yields of, of lipid being produced. And, and there are reports that uh, say that up to 90% of the cells right weight can be lipids in, in the aerobial liquid. So basically, all of this, the cell weight can be transformed into lipids, which is really good news. There are groups as well trying to fight some of the disadvantages I've mentioned before about the um, microbial oils, such as uh, the, the requirement for aseptic conditions, and this a group uh, uh, the, the group of Stephanopoulos in MIT worked in engineering and the Robia to be able to use phosphate instead of phosphate in order to grow in uh, um, less, less clean conditions, let's say. There has been a lot of works, uh, like, yeah, hundreds of works per, almost per year, different producing different type of lipids with high values, some of them unusual lipids. Uh, and they have been also quite a good amount of research in engineering the Arabia to use low-cost substrate. Uh, there are a few works as well in, in facilitating the secretion of this lipid to facilitate or also or to fight one of these disadvantages we mentioned at the beginning, that is the need to extract this lipid from, from the cell. And now we're gonna deep a little bit uh, more into some particular examples uh, coming up from the lab and using the Arabia to make lipids in a more sustainable way. And when we talk about sustainability, we should not only think about the environment, uh, but also about the economics of the process. And here I present a typical process from, from the upstream part where you have the substrate, when it's loaded into the fermentation, and then when you have your lipid being produced, they need to go to a downstream part where they need to be recovered, isolated, purified, and polished. And, and we need to consider that all these parts contribute to the cost of the process. So if we want the, the, the overall process to be economically feasible, we need to think about decreasing the, the cost of each of them. And of course, by increasing tighter yields and productivities, we can make fermentation more efficient. But we also need to consider which is the substrate we are using, is it cheap enough, uh, and how we can recover the product in, a, in an easy way. So I'm gonna bring some examples about each of these each of these sections. And I, we're gonna start by the first one, by the upstream uh, process and how to expand the, the range of uh, substrate that Jarobia can use. So I, I should mention Jarobia is naturally good at producing at, at using different carbon, uh, carbon so sources like like glycerol, uh, uh, glucose, or hydrophobic substrate like alkanes or even uh, fatty acids. But we wanted to expand this to use uh, cheap uh, substrate that are usually wasted in industry, like starch. 
uh, which is the first example that I bring. So starch are these granules, it's the second most abundant polymer uh, sugars on Earth, and it's made of sugar units, but in a very complex arrangement, so they are very inaccessible to, to bugs, so they microorganisms, uh, if they lack these uh, key uh, enzymatic activities, alpha amylase and glucomylase, they are unable to use them. And Yarovel lacks these uh, two enzymes. So in this work, we express these two enzymes, we secrete them out, and, and we found that the, we were able to, to, to see how Yarovel was expressing these two enzymes actively in supernate and degrading these granules that were unable to be degraded by the wider. And we further engineer uh, lipid metabolism by uh, enhancing the Kennedy pathway and blocking beta oxidation to, in the end, produce these lipids from uh, raw starch or from effluent from a bioethanol a company that was a waste contained uh, starch. So the another example, a series of examples, I'm going to talk now about the use of silos in Jarobia. And the Robia can use glucose but cannot use silos, and these two sugars as the main components of limocellulosic material that, as you may know, is one of the, one of the most wanted uh, substrate for, for biotechnology. So the idea was to transform them into lipids, and for that we first needed the Robia to use silos. And so in the first uh, work, we we identified the reason why Yarovia was not growing in this sub in, in silos is because these two first enzymes in the pathway were not really highly expressed. So what we did is to take these two enzymes, the silos reductase and silitote dehydrogenase, from an organism that is well known to, to utilize silos, and, and we put them in Yarovia together with the overexpression of the native cellular kinase, and we found that Yarovia was able to grow and was able to grow as good as in glucose. So this was good, good news, and we, we explore the production of lipids in different media containing silos uh, to make like 40%, almost 40% of the cell rate weight as lipids from silos only. In a follow-up work, we wanted to, to use the native genes, so we overexpressed the native genes instead of using heterodox ones, and we, we saw that these genes were able to sustain growth in silos, as good, if not better, as the heterogol genes. And then we use that strain not to use only silos, but a real limnocellulosic hydrolysate. In this case, the one coming from the tequila manufacturing. So for every liter of tequila, 10 kilograms of cellulosic biomass is wasted. And this waste can be converted into glucose and silos by hydrolysis. And by doing a little bit more metabolic engineering in these pathways, we were able to convert the whole glucose and silos extraction from this into lipids. And in, in, and in this work, we reached the maximum, maximum theoretical yield. So one thing that we observed when we tried to grow Jarobia in this mix of glucose and silos coming from immunocellulosic hydrolysate is that uh, Jarobia prefers the use of glucose. So as you can see here, in green, glucose is consumed first, and when uh, the, most of the glucose has been consumed, silos started to be taken up. And this is considered to be negative for a bioprocess, so uh, in this collabor collaborative work, we did an adaptive laborati laboratory evolution of the Arobia, of the Arobia that was engineered to be able to use silos, to be able to also uh, utilize silos in the presence of analogs of glucose. And after the evolution, we saw how both glucose and silos were co-consumed. And, and these strains uh, were not only able to produce lipids, but by, by a little bit of further modifications, they could also make other products out of silos. And in this collaboration with Vinod uh, Kumar from Cranfield University, we used the same strain that we developed with a little bit of further modifications to make succinic acid and silito. The next example is uh, about how to make something that is a little bit higher value than just uh, neutral lipids, just three acetylcellulose. And I'm going to talk about beta carotene, which is a uh, lipid soluble uh, molecule that is uh, antioxidant, vitamin precursor, the precursor of vitamin A, and it's also a cholera. So it has many applications in pharma, cosmetics, food, and, and feed industry. And here we, we, we express uh, different enzymes 
uh, that were required to complete the pathway towards beta carotene uh, from the mevalonate pathway that was native in Jarrobia. So these two enzymes were uh, required heterologously, uh, and, and these two were expressed in this cassette together with the last step from the mevalonate pathway uh, here, GSS1. And by, by putting this cassette into Jarrobia, we were able to, to see this orange color that is typical from beta carotene. So we, we did uh, several modifications and, and in the end we wanted to optimize the flux towards this pathway and what we did is, is coming back to this cassette here with there are three key genes controlled by three different promoters. We wanted to optimize this cassette to maximize the fluxes and we did that by a combinatorial library assembly where we uh, basically make a library where every promoter in the library was able to control every of the genes and in the end, this library could be transformed into Jarovia. And because uh, luckily beta carotene can be easily screened by eye, we should be able to select the most orange genes to identify by sequencing which are the key promoters in the, in the cassette that drive the highest expression of the beta carotene. We did that. We obtained something similar to what we were expecting. We sequenced the best uh, cassettes. We reconstructed the strains that after incorporating several copies that we took to the bioreactor. And, and we reach a production of six gram per liters of this uh, relatively high value compound. We follow up that uh, that work, and we are still working on, on on this area. This is a collaboration with Jose Luis Martinez in ETU, where we use high throughput bioreactors, micro micro scale fermentations, to optimize the culture conditions, and and we we find out how drastically production can vary uh, by controlling environmental factors rather than genetic factors. So there's a lot of optimization that can be done after your strain has been uh, maximized in, in flask in the lab or, or standard bioreactors. So the last uh, example today is about the downstream part of the process. As I mentioned before, one of the limitations of microbial oils is the, the extraction of these lipids from the cell. You need to break down the cells using either mechanical, physical, or chemi chemical agents that can disrupt the cells and allow the, the structure or basically the oils and solvent that are kind of not very good for the environment to extract this uh, this product. So we're trying to get around that by engineering Jarovia to secrete uh, these fatty acids. So the neutral lipids, the main lipid uh, storage lipid in Jarovia, triacylglycerols cannot cross membranes and they are well stored in these uh, lipid bodies that we've visualized before with these screening droplets. Um, but what we did is to block the, the activation of free fatty acid and the beta oxidation of this free fatty acid to so consumption or degradation in order to convert the, the neutral lipid moiety into amphipathic lipid moiety. And we know amphipathic lipids can cross membranes. So we, we we, we did several approaches. Uh, one strategy where we enhance the Kennedy pathway to make more of the neutral lipid first and then over express different intracellular lipases to maximize the production of free fatty acids. And a second strategy where, where, where we basically blocked the production of three acid glycerols at all and we express diosterases that basically convert the acyl CoA moieties into free fatty acid moieties that cross. We found similar results of secret fatty acid, around three, three gram per liters in each case, and, and we optimized the libid conditions in, in fermentation. And, and what, what we saw is like the, when the, there are enough lipids secreted outside, this lipid aggregates and they are very easily to, they are basically easily recovered and you don't really need a lot of energy to do this. Also, what means it can be a cheap industrial bioprocess if this is industrialized. And here we then we were just fishing this lipid with a with a loop. Uh, and here you can see the how the wild type accumulate the lipids inside the cell, but how the engineer strains was secreting all these big droplets outside. And this allows us as well to uncouple biomass formation and, and, and lipid production, and we reach an equivalent of uh, 120 uh, uh, percentage of the cell dry weight as lipid. So something that is unable to be achieved only with intracellular lipid production. So I think uh, here I'm finishing my, my presentation today. A common message is um, 
I hope you learn a little bit about Jarovia, uh, the, the potential that it has. Uh, and, and I must say that this is not a close uh, topic. Uh, the field is growing exponentially. More and more groups, more and more industries are developing technologies for these organisms. So I'm sure you will hear more about this uh, in, the, in the following years. And the other thing is like, uh, whatever your process is, uh, think not only about yields, tighter productivity, still about the economy of the process and how uh, viable it is going to be. And, and for this, the best thing is to directly talk to companies which have this expertise. So just so quickly, uh, I'm going to mention that uh, in the lab we are working in other things that are related or unrelated. We are working in Jarovia Lipolitica Engineering for the production of other things uh, like terpenoids or flavonoids, but we are working also with uh, Cerebisi and all the many other organisms that you show in the previous slide. We are also working in developing new synthetic biology tools for metabolic engineering like, the, like technologies for multiplexing CRISPR, and we are also exploring microbial communities as a new tool to, to make uh, bioprocesses. And with this, I would like to acknowledge all the members of the group, all the funding bodies, and, and uh, the organizer of the of the webinar, and all of you for your attention. We will happy, we'll be happy to take any question. Uh, thanks a lot, Rodrigo, for this really nice um, overview talk. Um, the first questions are coming in. So we have one question from question from Alejandra Sanchez. Um, uh, on uh, the use of other yeasts. So do you think that Yarovia is the best yeast to produce microbial lipids uh, compared to other ones? And um, if yes, why or why not? So it's a good question. Uh, it's a good one. Um, and for each particular lipid, probably you will have a better one. So there are, there are some organisms that without any modification, like Rhodotrula terulloides, can produce much more amount of lipids than Jarovia. So I think one of the advantages of Jarovia is that we have converted it, like a whole scientific community working on this, we have converted it into conventional. Uh, and now we have a lot of tools that we can use to engineer it, and that make it a very good organism to produce these things. There are limitations still in Jarovia, Sometimes it's filaments, sometimes it produces too much uh, waste products like citric acid. Um, so it, it, it's still a good one, despite the limitations. There are some others, there are emerging ones with a lot of potential. Depends on your, yeah, or your specific product, I will recommend to select one or another. Great. Um, then we have a question from John Morrissey. Um, are there any or yeah, many lipid products made commercially at this point from Yarovia? I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, are, there are a lot of companies starting now to work with Yarovia. Uh, there's several startups, but there's also some big company that has been exploring Yarovia for commercial purposes. The, one example was DuPont several years ago which uh, got approval to make omega-3 fatty acids. They go to the, 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 the point where they, they scale the production and they started to produce, but uh, at some point they decided to stop the process, so that's not happening anymore. Uh, I know of others that are trying to get to scale, but I'm not aware of, of many that are successful. Thanks. Um, then we have a question from Yan Mei Zhu. Um, how do you detect lipid content in the yeast cells? Will the temperature affect uh, lipid production in Yarovia? Um, and uh, when will the lipid content reach the highest level in the cell? I assume during growth, which growth stage? Okay, so um, regarding the, um, the how we measure lipid, we measure lipid with GCMS or GC. ID. So we extract uh, the lipid, we transmethylate them and we quantify that with the standard standard. Uh, there are other ways uh, to estimate by fluorescence or things like that, but they are not as accurate. So in the end, we always go to GT. Regarding the temperature, it's a good question. There, 
there are variations with the temperature in production level. There are even more variations in the profile of fatty acids. So there are more uh, unsaturated acids uh, being produced at lower temperatures to keep the fluidity of the membrane. So depending, again, depending on your product of interest, if it's more unsaturated, you might have better uh, ratios when you grow at a lower temperatures. And the third question was uh, about the phase of the culture. Uh, so normally uh, we work in nitrogen limitation conditions. So at a certain moment in the culture, nitrogen is limiting and there's a still carbon source present. And then is when the, there is a, a highest increase in intracellular lipid production, which uh, is a natural response of the cells to store this extra carbon and not waste it or leave it for other competitors in the environment. And, and some of the modification that we have done in Jarovia allowed Jarovia to start accumulating more from the very beginning. So it, depending on the strains, some of them just start accumulating early on, some of them were nitrogen depletion happen. Um, we also had a question on toxicity. So do you have any problems with fatty acid toxicity at these high production levels? So in general, we, we haven't observed a lot of toxicity with fatty acid. And this is because, as I mentioned, the Rubia de Politica kind of have evolved to utilize fatty acid as a main kind of source. We have observed toxicity with a specific the length of fatty acids, uh, like C10, for example, is toxic urobia. But in, in general, like folic acids or things like that, it can tolerate as much as you want to give, to, give it. Um, what's the approximate yield of lipids from glucose or on other carbon sources? Question uh, yeah, I'm not sure I have the right numbers in my head. I would say, yeah, correct me uh, if I'm wrong, I would say it's around 2.3 is the maximum fluid you can yield from glucose around that. Uh, that's difficult to get. I mentioned in one slide that we achieved that, but I, there was a kind of, I was cheating a little bit there because it was a complex linocellulosic, linocellulosic hydrolysate. So this yield was calculated by, from uh, glucose and silos only, but there are other things there, like acetic acid, that Jarovia can also use to contribute to, to that. Con concerning yield, I have a question on my own also, like because, for example, for the beta carotene production, you're basically competing with neutral lipids for precursors because they both use acetyl CoA as precursors. But on the other hand, you're also, I guess, the neutral lipids are also beneficial for storing. Uh, the beta carotene. So, what would be the best way to to balance this, having still like some co storage compartment, but on the other hand, uh, also increasing the yields for for beta carotene production? Yeah, that's a good. That's a very good question, and we still don't know. We are working on that. Um, what we observe in that work is like the more lipid we had, the more beta carotene was produced. Um, what was not expected in the beginning, and, and the answer is what you just mentioned, storage. And we know beta carotene, if it's not, if there's not enough lipid bodies, it will go to the membrane, and then and will disrupt the membranes, and is where toxicity is come from. Uh, if you have enough lipid bodies, it, it can tolerate much better um, this um, this beta carotene, and, and it doesn't form crystals or anything that can disrupt other other part of the cell. Uh, there might be a sweet spot somewhere between one or the other. Uh, we tried with extracellular lipids uh, to control the intracellular level, it doesn't work, because I think somehow they need to be produced at the same time to be properly stored. Uh, but yeah, there should be a, a balance that we will try to find at some point. Um, also, quick question maybe at the end was like, have you tried to produce the, the short chain um, fatty acids? Question by Tom Mc so we we tried briefly with these diesterases that are specific for short chain fatty acids like uh, coconuts from coconuts. Um, 
we didn't succeed in the analysis in the experiment where we secreted the fatty acid. We thought, okay, the hysteresis are known to be specific of length. We might be able to preferentially secrete a specific length from them. It didn't work like that. Uh, there are other groups uh, working in Jerobia who has been extensively working on short change and, and they're good at good, yeah, good results that they, they have achieved with different lengths from 12 to 8 or 6. Great. So I guess a lot of more uh, interesting questions and they are like, they continue popping up, but unfortunately, I think we have to move on in the program. So thanks a lot again for a really um, nice talk, interesting overview talk, uh, and also for the to the audience for posing the, posing the questions. Um, and we will, thanks again, Rodrigo, and we will continue in the same line. So that was a nice introduction also to the following talk. Um, which will be by Carolus uh, Petkevicius, who is a PhD student at the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Biosustainability at the Technical University of Denmark. And he will uh, talk about the biotechnological production of the European corn borer sex pheromone in the yeast, Jauberle Politica. So please go ahead. Yes, so hello everyone and uh, thanks for thanks for introduction. Uh, Yes, so my name is Karelis and I will be talking about insect sex pheromone production in uh, yeast uh, Yaroviale Politica and specifically I will focus on production of uh, uh, European corn borer sex pheromone and the reason why this insect is interesting it is because it is the main pest of the maize worldwide it is distributed in north america north africa and and the europe and if measures are not taken up to 20 percent of the crops might be lost due to damage caused by this insect and currently uh, to solve this problem uh, chemical insecticides or genetically modified crops are used however there are other alternatives uh, uh, for example uh, one could use insect sex pheromones to to solve this problem and specifically Austrinia nobilalis uses insect sex pheromone blend which is composed of uh, E11 and Z11 tetradecenyl acetates and uh, here is the biosynthetic pathway how this insect produces uh, this uh, fatty acetate mixture so Everything starts from palmetoyl CoA, which undergoes one cycle of beta oxidation, and uh, myristic uh, acid is generated, which is then desaturated at position number 11. And this desaturation step provides the mixtures of E and Z11 uh, tetradecanoic uh, acids, which are then uh, converted into corresponding alcohols and finally acetylated. And the, the ratio between these isomers is dependent on the strain. It is known that Austrina nobilalis has two strains, E strain and Z strain. And E strain primarily uses E isomer of, uh, e of these acetates, while the Z strain primarily uses Z isoform of these acetates. And uh, uh, we, as a group, we we're interested in production of Z1114 acetate because it is uh, the the most prevalent Austrinia strain in the world. And for that, we have chosen the East Yarovia Lipolitica because as you can see from uh, this uh, review, if uh, someone wants to produce uh, relatively expensive fatty acid derivatives and high titers, Yarovia seems to be uh, seems to be a very good option for that. So uh, 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 can you see my entire screen? Sorry. Yeah, we, we see the entire yes, slide, but not everything is displayed yet. So. Yes. Okay. So here on the right side, you can see which steps have to be taken in order to produce uh, Z1114 acetate. And as you can see, the first step is production of myristic acid. And in general, uh, in yeast, uh, the novel production of saturated fatty acids relies on fatty acid synthase, which is a huge uh, protein consisting of alpha chain and beta chain, alternatively called FAS1 and FAS2. And a couple of years ago, quite nice discovery was made that if you mutate ketosyl synthase domain, 
you can increase myristic acid production. And uh, we were inspired by that. And we replaced isolution with phenylalanine. And we increased production of myristic acid by ninefold. So that was uh, great. That was the first step towards the insect pheromone. And as you can see, the next step is uh, introduction of double bond at position 11 uh, in, in myristic acid. And uh, as I mentioned previously, we were interested in the in the production of Z isomers. So theoretically, the saturase should uh, produce uh, mostly Z isomer and only small amounts of uh, E isomer. So here on the left side, you can see the screening of fatty acid desaturases. So as a control, I took the strain which was engineered for myristic acid production and introduced seven different desaturases which have been described in literature. And uh, from this screening, you can see that the saturase LBOPTQ produced the highest amounts of uh, Z11 tetradecanoic acid, while some of the desaturases, they were not active or they were less active compared to LBOPTQ. And the next step was, uh, and in the next step, we were interested to see if this Z11 tetradecanoic acid can actually be converted into corresponding alcohol. So for that, I took LBOPTQ strain and expressed four different uh, reductases on top of LBOPTQ strain. And here you can see that two candidates appear to be quite good. So it's reductase SLIDPGFAR2 and reductase HARFAR. And even though SLIDPGFAR produced uh, the highest amounts of total fatty alcohols, uh, we have uh, selected HARFAR as the best candidate because, as you can see, tighter wise, there was not a big difference. Uh, but however, Harfar produced slightly higher purity of our target compound, which was uh, Z1114 alcohol. So yes, in summary, LBOPTQ and Harfar were selected as candidates for production of Z1114 alcohol. So uh, after this enzyme screening, we, we moved further and then we did a small round of uh, metabolic engineering where we took a high myristic acid producing strain, we introduced two copies of reductase, two copies of desaturase, and finally we have regulated fatty acid synthase subunit 1 from Eurovia lipolytica. And here you can see that the best strain is strain 9253, which produced in small scale around 100 milligrams per liter of our product. And uh, once the small scale screening was done, the strain then went into one liter fermenters, where compared to the small scale, we actually managed to increase the titer by twofold. And we obtained uh, uh, the titer of 200 milligrams per liter of Z1114 alcohol. And uh, after that, as the final step, in order to convert this alcohol into active pheromone ingredient into acetate, uh, we extracted fatty alcohols from fermentation broth and then uh, uh, chemical acetylation was done and the chemical acetylation of fatty alcohols yield uh, in this uh, fatty acetate mixture our target product Z1114 uh, acetate uh, comprised around 7% of total fatty acetate content and the the ratio between Z, uh, between E and Z isomer was roughly was roughly nine to one. And uh, so as the last step, we tested biological activity of yeast derived insect pheromone. And this was done by our collaborators in Democritos in Greece. So it was done by Dr. Maria, Eleni and Petri within the framework of EU funded Olefine project. And experiment they did what is called the wind tunnel experiment where you have insect on one end of the tunnel and where you have the uh, pheromone blend on the other side. And then once you have insect and pheromone in one in, in wind tunnel, then you apply the wind towards the insect and you observe how insect behaves. So in this case, uh, two parameters were monitored. It's approach and landing. So approach means, uh, and the question is, if insect uh, at all flies towards this pheromone blend and the landing uh, was uh, quantified based on uh, if the insect approaches then how for how long the insect sits on on this uh, is derived pheromone blend so here you can see the control which is uh, only organic solvent without no pheromone then uh, as a positive control it is the 
uh, native pheromone blend of Astrina nubilalis. And here, BioFe is our yeast derived pheromone sample. And uh, you can see that uh, compared to the negative control, uh, yeast derived pheromone blend definitely elicited uh, an elicited insect behavior. However, it was not as strong compared to the behavior which was which was uh, which was observed when the positive control was was used so even though there is uh, a still place for improvement for example the fatty acetate mixture contained only seven percent of our target compound and the ratio between e and z isomers it was uh, it was not the most optimal but uh, yeah i think uh, these results could could be considered as success and it can show that yeast derived pheromones could actually modulate insect behavior and they could uh, uh, for in the future they could be used for insect uh, insect management and uh, so yes at the at the very end i would like to thanks uh, say big thank for the people who contributed to this work and also for the biofero innovations fund and uh, olefine who who financially contributed to to this work Thanks, Carlos, for a very clear presentation. Uh, very nice result. Um, are there any questions in the chat? Um, John Morris says, very nice talk. Uh, are you close to field trials? Uh, uh, honestly, I, I don't think so, because the amounts for the field trials, they, they have to be increased. And uh, yeah, the sample which we have was yeah, simply, simply too small for that. Yes, uh, thanks. Then I, I have a question more concretely about the uh, the pathway you chose or the, the, the enzymes. Um, when we selected or tested different reductases, because acyl reductases can be find, found in, in all kinds of organisms, but you specifically selected those from, from insects. Why yes. was that? Why, do they have a yeah more specific uh, substrate spectrum or? So the very uh, very first thing which uh, is uh, is evident when you so these enzymes they are characterized and very first uh, mm -hmm. uh, thing which has to be considered that all of these uh, reductases they are not taking uh, c18 fatty acids which are the most abundant so by excluding c18 fatty acid conversion into alcohols mm -hmm. we can already get a much higher purity of uh, c14 fatty alcohol for example Yes, that's that's a very good reason, I think. So, yeah. um, but then you do the last step, the the esterification or the acetylation. You do chemically, but uh, would there theoretically be also enzymes that could do that uh, in in vivo in the yeast? So once again, I would be fan of using, uh, let's say, acetyl transferases from the particular insects because uh, I expect they might be also more specific but uh, so far no acyl transferases from the insects uh, have been characterized and mm -hmm. there are several attempts which which failed to find enzymes which can convert fatty as fatty alcohols into fatty acetates and uh, there's actually atf1 acetyl transferase from saccharomyces which could do the job and uh, previously my supervisor have tried but uh, once you express we cannot uh, we cannot obtain full conversion so some of the fatty alcohols they are still there while chemical acetylation we obtain full conversion from alcohols to acetates and as you can see it was done in one hour with the relatively cheap chemicals so it's like simply easier to to extract fatty alcohols and do chemical conversion rather than to look for the enzymes but Yarovia doesn't have any acetyl transferases at all that so that you see a small portion of uh, esters coming up you only see the alcohols yes yes um then you showed showed that like, in your fermentation your you get titers up to up to 200 milligrams per liter what would be what would be the aim you're you're looking for Oof. so in uh, in our group like we have the paper on different pheromone which is on the other hand very similar which is z1116 uh, 
basically two carbons longer and here we produce around two grams per liter so i think uh, yeah like somewhere in in the range of grams per liter yeah w would be yeah would be definitely <laughs> good i would be satisfied with that <laughs> as we could, like achieve the tighter as it was for different pheromone which is already published how much time do you have left in your phd maybe you can <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I started in 2019 June, and I have three years. So I will start. I will finish the 2022 in the midsummer. So some time left to reach the grumper. Uh, fingers just... crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Great. Um, any more questions? Not at the moment. But if not, then I would uh, thank you and all the other speakers again for great talks. And I hope that those talks were a real nice appetizer um, for the Yeast Lipid Conference next year. So I hope we'll see you all in Sweden and in Gothenburg in 2022. Um, I don't know if John wants to say anything else. Yes. I, I, I thanks, uh, Verena. I think you know I always want to speak. Um, so I, I would uh, maybe we can stop sharing screens there now. Um, so I'd like to add my congratulations to all of the speakers and indeed to our, our, our session chairs for selecting the speakers and, and uh, for keeping us on track uh, with the questions. I think that was really interesting. I, I have no doubt that um, the talks will have whetted appetites for uh, the East Lipid Conference next year. Yes, uh, I, think. I think it's really interesting. I think it's really interesting to see. Um, I mean, that mixture of, of fundamental research, research related to human diseases, and then you know, very interesting applications. Um, I, 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 I think for Carlos, I mean, I think we will demand that by next year he, he has at least you, you know doubled his yield. I mean, if you can't do that in a year, but but. Uh, <laughs> Only joking, you know. I'm sure it, it, the project looks like it looks like it's going really well, and um, so I enjoyed those presentations. Um, obviously, uh, you, you've seen the the website for the Yeast Lipid Conference for next year, so so I would encourage you to log on and get on that that mailing list. I just want to say as well, uh, sometime in in the coming months, Fem's Yeast Research will launch a call for papers. Uh, for people who are interested in submitting uh, papers on yeast lipids, uh, and you'll be able to submit your papers to the journal in the in the normal way, and we'll we'll collect those papers uh, and publish them uh, as a, as a, a special issue around the time of the yeast lipid conference. But they'll be typical normal research papers, uh, like the papers you can see in uh, the virtual special issue that that's that's for this conference. So um, I think everything we heard today. It's you know the kind of papers that are very suitable for FEMS use research. Uh, we, we'd love to have uh, some of those high quality 200 papers a year that are being submitted uh, that, that Rodrigo told us about uh, on, on Eurovia. And I'm sure as well by the time we come to the Yeast Lipid Conference, we, we, the, the, the Rhodospiridium uh, yeast lipid researchers will be fighting back and will we'll be presenting some of their exciting work as well on that particular platform which I think is also a very exciting platform uh, into the future for um, biotechnological production of yeast lipids. So uh, I think that, oh, actually one, one, one further point um, I forgot to make, but uh, I've been reminded in the chat by, um, by, by, by the um, technical team, there were some questions that we didn't get to earlier because we had a lot of questions um, for, for some of the speakers and we just didn't have time to address all of them. So we will pass those questions onto the speakers, and uh, the speakers uh, might be able to, e along with email addresses of the questioners, and so the speakers will be able to respond directly to the people who ask questions. So apologies that um, that we weren't able to get to everyone's question as we went through. Um, there just wasn't enough time. And of course, when you come to the Yeast Lipid Conference next year, you'll be able to chat to those same people at the coffee break and. Uh, at a free beer session that, that Verena is going to organize for everybody. And, and so there'll be plenty of time to, to have additional discussions. It'll have to be free because anyway, anyway, it will be free. I was going to say something I didn't mean to trouble. Um, 
So um, with that, uh, I'll thank the speakers. I'll th thank the attendees. We had uh, well over 200 people attending. Uh, I'll, I'll thank um, Sarah and Joe behind the scenes from FEMS and from uh, uh, Oxford University Press who gave all the technical support that made this run run pretty smoothly, very smoothly. And um, I'll let you know as well that this is recorded, so it will be appearing on the FEMS YouTube channel in due course, along with the other webinars that we've had. So, you know, if you want to listen back to, to the talks, or if you want to recommend the talks to any of your colleagues who weren't able to attend, you'll be able to do that. So, Verena uh, and Ed, are, are, are you happy, or do you, is there anything you need to add, or will we, will we wrap up? Just also for me, thank all the speakers and um, uh, and also you and the team at uh, at FEMS for organizing this. Okay, okay, so we're we're done and dusted. Uh, thank you, everybody, and over and out.